So you want a new smartphone with a camera that isn't total pants, but your budget is sadly a wee bit off the Pixel 8 Pro. Well, do not despair because quite a few mid-range mobiles now pack a respectable set of optics that can spaff out decent pics of your cats, kids, beverages, whatever you want to share on Instagram in the vague hope that someone out there actually cares about any of it. Now I've tested and reviewed loads of wallet-friendly smartphones here on Techspert, so here's my personal pick of the very best to have some decent optics slapped on the back. And for more on the latest and greatest tech, please do poke subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers! So if photography is a priority for you, then one of the absolute best mid-range options right now is Google's Pixel 7a. It may sport a placky back, but the Pixel 7a still looks lush and is proper water resistant, with the metal frame and camera bump plus this charming light blue colour option. That display is a G-OLED panel where the G most likely stands for GOOSH. It's bright, poppy and HDR10 certified, while the stereo speakers spaff out some decent audio. The Pixel 7a is powered by Google's Tensor G2, just like the Pixel 7 and 7 Pro. So this mini mobile doesn't sh** the bed when you slap up the graphics settings in Genshin Impact. And what you have here is a 64 megapixel Sony IMX787 sensor, never before stuffed inside of a Pixel phone, or any other phones at all pretty much besides the ZTE Axon 40 blowers from last year. This new hardware combined with Google's image processing chops is a solid combo in most circumstances, so I was happy enough with the majority of my test photos. The lens does a dependable job of locking onto your subject following an update, even if the scene is rather messy, while images are impressively lifelike rather than manipulated to look more pleasing to the eye. If it's a sunny day, you'll have to be a little bit careful to avoid any lens flare, but otherwise the Pixel 7a can cope well with harsh backlighting. HDR ain't a problem, with blue skies capably captured. Those portrait chops are pretty decent too. This phone can even deal with crazy windswept hair and furry subjects like this wee chap. Ambient snaps can look a little bit soft at times, those textures and facial features can be just a wee bit too smooth, but colours are usually on point and as long as there's no rapid movement then you'll get sharp enough results. My indoor pics had plenty of finer details packed in there. Your manual controls are limited to EV and contrast basically. If you want anything more complex than that, then you're going to have to look at an alternative blower. But those on-screen sliders work really, really well and they can rescue an otherwise murky looking shot. And this comes in handy at times in the evenings, although this blower does a solid job there too. Strong lighting can pose a problem in a night scenario, but otherwise it's all good. We're talking not much noise and a reasonable amount of detail. Now that 13 meg ultra wide angle shooter is another Sony IMX special and photos shot with this are rather consistent. Once again producing natural tones just like the primary shooter if not quite as much detail. Although unfortunately the distortion is rather bad which heavily distracts. The Pixel 7a can also record up to 4K resolution video and it's certainly fine if not remarkable in this department. Visuals are sharp and well defined as long as you're not shooting in the dark and even in the evenings you'll usually get something that works. That focus still occasionally pops especially if the lighting sucks but the stabilisation is good enough for moving about and recording even at that Ultra HD level. Audio capture is also good as long as the environment isn't too noisy and there's not much wind. And last up that 13 meg selfie snapper is okay-ish. It's not the worst, but it's pretty bog standard stuff, pumping out soft, bland snaps if the lighting ain't great. If you're obsessed with posting pics of your gun and mug online, you may be swayed by another handset like the Galaxy A54. Now another decent choice right now is the Nothing Phone 2A. Maybe a bit of a brick compared with the Pixel, but it sure does stand out from the crowd with its spangly disco arse and its unique black and white launcher. For this price, the performance is stunning, serving up a smooth slice of Genshin action even on the highest graphics settings. Plus that battery life is really ruddy impressive. Overall, there's not a lot not to like. And the camera, while certainly not flawless, is dependable enough for everyday shooting, while also creepily looking like the cold dead eyes of one of their minion things. And what you got here is a dual lens setup. That primary shooter is a Samsung GN9 sensor with optical image stabilization built in. And by default, this captures photos at 12 megapixels. You can boost up to 50 megs if you want. And I was generally quite happy with my test shots. You do see some saturation in brighter light, but colors otherwise appear quite close to what you'll see with your peepers. And in tricky contrast, you do have nothing's new Ultra XDR mode. 
for the ultimate HDR shots. This captures 8 pics at different dynamic levels, then combines them into a tasty HDR pie. So even if you're basically shooting into the light, you'll get similar results to an iPhone. It's not a natural looking pic, but those darker areas are brightly reproduced, while lighter elements aren't too blown out. Now shooting living subjects can be slightly more complicated in ambient light. As usual with mid-range phones, you'll get blurred results if the buggers won't stay still. But in better light, the Nothing Phone 2A is a pleasingly nippy snapper. These shots are taken at the one time zoom level with that Ultra XDR mode active. And these right here are taken at two times zoom again with XDR. The portrait mode is generally reliable for adding some bokeh style smudging if you're into all of that. And while there's no dedicated night mode, the Nothing Phone 2A can prolong the exposure in low light to brighten things up. So you'll get crispy detail and again pretty good tones as long as your hands are still. Alternatively, those glyph lights also work in a pinch as a funky sort of flash for night shots. As for the second lens slapped on the back, well, that is an ultra-wide angle affair using Samsung's JN1 sensor, I believe it is. And though despite sticking with Samsung for both sensors, the ultra-wide does still produce warmer tones. It's alright, pretty much standard fare at this price. And then for your video type shenanigans, where you can shoot at 1080p, full HD, otherwise 4K at 30 frames per second. You can bump up to 60 frames per second at Ultra HD though. And for the majority of my test video, the Nothing Phone 2A did its job. The focus is pretty fast to react to sudden changes. Those visuals are detailed enough to look good on a big screen. The audio is generally captured cleanly in the immediate surroundings. Things only really get muddy at a distance or when there's a lot of random environmental noise. That stabilisation doesn't give the most natural vibe, but it is good at smoothing out your footage when you're moving and shooting. And I did experience a couple of little issues though, including some short juddery spells when shooting at 4K, which I'm hoping will be blasted by the next camera update. And then for all of your selfie shenanigans, you've got a 32 megapixel front facing snapper here on the Nothing Phone 2 here. I believe it's the exact same tech as the Nothing Phone 2. And this does a perfectly decent job. You've got natural looking snaps with all of those lovely crease lines captured in perfect detail in brighter light. At least things get a bit softer in ambient light. Plus, of course, a reliable portrait mode to wipe out all of those weird background lurkers. I mean, if you want to shoot yourself a bit of video using that selfie cam, well, it maxes out at Full HD, sadly, no 4K option here. But again, the Nothing Fun 2 here seems to do the job perfectly for Skype and Zoom and all that kind of stuff. Mike's doing his job of picking up your voice, even at a distance. So now let's take a squint at Samsung and its Galaxy A54 mid-ranger, which looks not too dissimilar to the S24, but thankfully is a lot less punishing on your bank account. This is powered by another of Samsung's Exodus chipsets, and it can cope with some sweaty gaming action, no worries. While that One UI experience is reasonably smooth, and it also looks rather ruddy stunning on that poppy as you like AMOLED display. Battery life is good enough for over 6 hours of screen on time per charge, even with lots of audio streaming in the background. Although the Samsung Galaxy A54 does admittedly top off at 25 watt wide charging, which is a bit poo. And one of the other updates is the all new 50 meg camera sensor, now bigger than ever for improved low light photography, allegedly, plus some of that hot optical image stabilisation. Unfortunately, my test of the Galaxy A54's optics didn't get off to the most illustrious of starts as I realised that the shutter speed wasn't particularly swift. So if you're attempting to shoot a living subject that does not obey your orders, then expect lots of blurry snaps of them just as they're turning away or buggering right off. Still, if you do actually manage to time it right, you'll often get a great looking portrait snap, with the added bonus that you can piddle about with that background bokeh action after you've hit the shutter button. While colours aren't always naturally captured, I've got to give props to the A54 because my test photos were quite pleasing to the eye, even though shot with less than ideal lighting. If you're dealing with harsh contrast, it's rare to see any oversaturation here. The A54 spaffs out well-balanced pics, even in the face of bright lighting. And in more ambient light, things don't get too soft. It's not until evening time that you'll get noise creeping in, although Samsung's night mode can help to brighten and sharpen things up a little. You will again struggle with moving subjects, however, ending up with blurry or disfigured pics like this. As well as the 50 meg sensor, the A54 serves up a 12 meg ultra wide angle shooter that's basic but not particularly bad. It comes in handy if you want a different vibe or you're just trying to capture something absolutely effing massive. 
And that third lens is a 5 meg macro shooter if you fancy a bit of extreme close-up action. And as always with Samsung smartphones, you've got a plethora of bonus camera modes, including the obligatory food mode if you like to snap pics of your dinner and post them online before cramming it into your face. And it certainly makes edible stuff look even tastier by boosting the tones and textures. And there's my own personal favourite, the fun mode, which is just so much darn fun that I might have just hemorrhaged from enjoying myself too much. Samsung blows are usually reliable enough for your home movies as well and if you swap to video mode you can shoot up to 4K Ultra HD footage at 30 frames per second. I was certainly happy enough again at this sort of mid-range price point does a great job, crisp visuals, clear audio pickup and respectable stabilisation. And last up is that 32 meg selfie shooter which like the rear cam does a decent job in all kinds of lighting, complete with a screen flash feature for low light that mostly just blinds you. And if you want to shoot some video using that front facing selfie cam, well, again, this tops off at 4K resolution, which is still surprisingly rare. For a mid-range mobile, a lot of them do top off at full HD. Again, the audio pickup's absolutely fine, and I had no troubles using the A54 for Skype and Zoom and all that online video shenanigans. And if your budget happens to be tighter than a starfish's sphincter, well, no worries. Samsung also offers up the cheaper Galaxy A34. This 6.6 inch is still IP67 water and dust resistant just like the A54 and it boasts many of that phone's best features including another bright and poppy Super AMOLED screen and a respectable stereo speaker setup. MediaTek's Dimensity 1080 is the brains of the operation so games usually play with a smooth frame rate while our 5000mAh battery keeps the Galaxy A34 chugging along nicely until you dive under the duvet at night. And then there's that camera tech, which is again a fairly flexible snapper, as long as you aren't too demanding. Now the shutter speed here on the Samsung Galaxy A34 is reasonably nippy, it doesn't take long at all to latch onto a face or some other subject. The main problem you have is processing speeds, especially if you're shooting portrait shots, as these take a little bit longer to process, so if you're trying to snap multiple portrait shots in quick succession, you'll find that actually you're probably waiting a good few seconds in between each one. That's certainly not ideal when you're trying to shoot pets or small children, but other more grown-up subjects will hopefully be a bit more still. In the case of Veronica here, very, very still. And then you get that lovely, gorgeous bokeh style effect, which you can change post-processing. Now, I found that when I was using the photo auto mode here on the Galaxy A34, that my photos tended to come out pretty well, as long as the lighting conditions weren't too dodgy. The A34 can generally handle a little bit of contrast, some bright backdrop action, for instance. In more ambient light and I did find that quite a lot of my photos were a bit softer. You certainly get a lot of noise and grain creeping in when that lighting is particularly low and while there is an automatically activated night mode which can help to brighten up your snaps a bit there's only so much that it can do. As always with Samsung smartphones you've got plenty of other bonus modes to play around with including of course naturally the fun mode. Oh Veronica that suits you although this is just Jesus Christ I don't even know what this is. It's gonna be in my dreams slash nightmares tonight that's for sure. Gotta say though, some of these could keep you amused for hours if you're either three years old or on all of the drugs. And I, those other bonus bits do include the obligatory food mode. You've also got a dedicated pro mode as well if you want to tweak the likes of the ISO levels, the white balance, the focus. And then you can quickly and easily swap to that ultra wide angle shooter at any point if you do want a more dramatic angle or just to fit more into frame. And in the more section is also where you'll find the macro mode to use that third and final lens. Personally, I'd rather just take a normal shot with the primary sensor and then crop in, but each to their own. And if you like to shoot home movies, swap to that video mode, you'll see you can shoot 4K resolution footage at just 30 frames per second. There is no 60 FPS option unless you drop it down to full HD resolution. I found that Samsung phones are usually pretty really good at capturing home movies and the Galaxy A34 is more limited than its more expensive siblings, but still does a decent job. You've got some crisp visuals on that 4K resolution mode. Image stabilization is decent, you can move and shoot, no worries at all. The audio capture is strong in all directions, but things do fall apart a bit in lower light again, so I'll stick to the good lighting. And then if we swap around to that camera house in the wee nipple notch up top, well, it's a 13 megapixel selfie shooter. And it's again a similar story to the cameras slapped on the arse end. As long as the lighting isn't too ropey, then you should get a respectable look and snap with plenty of detail packed in there, a bit too much maybe. But in lower light you will get rather grainy results unless you use the blind and screen flash feature. 
And you can actually shoot 4K Ultra HD footage using that front-facing camera as well, which is pretty rare at this sort of price point, so it's good to see. Again, audio capture is fine, thanks to the Samsung Galaxy A34's excellent built-in mics. So if you want to do a bit of vlogging, it'll do the job. And if you're after quality hardware at a budget-friendly price, well, another brand worth sizing up is Poco. The Poco X6 and X6 Pro are two of its freshest phones. Dish it up a 1.5K AMOLED screen, stereo speakers, and all-day battery life, even if you're the most demanding of users, along with super fast charge support. That Pro model is more beefy than the regular vanilla version, with MediaTek's Dimensity 8300 Ultra chipset replacing the Snapdragon 7S Gen 2, but either can handle the occasional spot of gaming. And you've got basically the same camera setup on both, a 64 meg primary shooter with optical image stabilization, plus your bog standard 8 meg ultra wide angle and a pointless macro snapper. Now, as you can see, that camera app more or less identical on both of these handsets. You can drag down the toggles and various features like so. Got a slightly different layout, but again, that should be rectified when the Poco X6 gets that Hyper OS update. We got the same bonus camera features on both of these blows, the portrait mode, the night mode. You've also got a full on 64 megapixel high res mode. Quite handy if you want to capture a high res snap and then crop into it. And those photo results are quite similar between the Poco X6 and the X6 Pro. But the image processing shenanigans means you will notice some clear differences. For instance, occasionally the Pro will produce warmer or more vivid tones than the X6 regardless of whether both phones have that AI mode switched on or off. And usually when there's high dynamic range, those darker areas are slightly brightened in the Pro's pics to make finer details a little bit more clear. But besides that, it is comparable visual quality across a range of conditions, including quite murky, grainy results when you are shooting in dim light. And it's a similar story for the ultra-wide shooters on this Poco pair. And both phones can digitally zoom up to around five times before the picture gets quite drainy and a bit rubbish. And for your video based shenanigans where you can capture full HD footage at 30 or 60 frames per second on either Poco handset. Otherwise you can boost up to 4K as long as you don't mind dropping that frame rate to either 24 or 30 FPS. And again, no real discernible difference between the two when it comes to capturing home movies. Those visuals are pretty crisp. The audio capture is nice and clear. And the stabilization is fine. Just don't try shooting at night because everything looks crap. And then last up, no real shocks or surprises. You've got the same 16 megapixel selfie shooter up front on the Poco X6 and the Poco X6 Pro. And again, selfie results, very similar. Fine in good light. A bit more pants when things get dark. Another affordable alternative is the Poco F5 or the Poco F5 Pro, a pair of MIUI mobiles that are proper well specced. They may look nothing like each other and the specs are decidedly different too, but they're still beefy enough to handle any Android games out there. Battery life is decent, charging speeds are nippy and they both serve up another vibrant OLED screen and stereo speaker setup. Definitely check out my side-by-side -side Poco F5 versus Poco F5 Pro comparison to see which one might be best for you. The good news is that when it comes to the optics, these Poco blowers share the same camera hardware, although the shooting experience isn't quite identical. Now it's the exact same camera app and camera UI on both. That said, there are some differences between the two. For instance, the Poco F5 Pro has proper eye focus and also motion tracking focus, which you don't get on the regular Poco F5. As you can see there, it can detect faces, however. Apart from that, it's very similar camera experience. The shutter speed, nice and nippy. And as you would imagine, there's not really any difference at all in the quality of the samples that I shot on the Poco F5 versus the F5 Pro. Both perfectly capable cameras, certainly when the lighting is decent and in more ambient light, as long as your subject doesn't move around like an absolute mentalist, then it's all good too. I particularly like the portrait effects on the Poco F5 and the Poco F5 Pro. Nice bit of bokeh action, really helps your subject to stand out. And these phones didn't struggle with slightly trickier conditions like high contrast either. And definitely go check out my full Poco F5 Pro review for more on the photo quality. You'll see that the Poco F5 and the Pro have the same basic camera modes, including portrait mode and night mode. If you jump into more, you'll see the Pro does have a couple of bonus bits like dual video and movie effects. But both phones can capture full 64 megapixel images and both boast a proper Pro mode where you can fiddle around with the ISO levels, the white balance, etc. Can't shoot in RAW, unfortunately, but hey ho. And you'll also spy some differences when it comes to shooting home movies because you've got an HDR option here on the Poco F5 Pro, not available on the Poco F5. 
And if we jump into the resolution settings, you'll see that the Poco F5 Pro can shoot up to 8K resolution footage or 4K at 30 or 60 frames per second, whereas the regular Poco F5 does max out at 4K res at just 30 FPS. And again, when it came to the video chops, no real difference between the Poco F5 and the Poco F5 Pro besides the fact you've got that 8K resolution support. I found that the Poco F5 was just as capable when it came to shooting that 4K resolution footage. Visuals are sharp, you've got bold colours as long as the lighting isn't cack again. And audio perfectly captured from all around for a perfect surround sound style effect. So yeah, overall, at this sort of price point, great stuff. And no difference when it comes to the selfie cam action here either because once again it's a 16 megapixel front facing shooter on both the Poco F5 and the Pro. And this does the job absolutely fine for your everyday selfies. You want to share them online even if you're shooting against a bright sky or capturing yourself in the club or some other ambient environment where light is at a premium. It's all good. And the Poco F5 just like the Poco F5 Pro maxes out at full HD resolution, no 4K shenanigans for that front facer. But you know, it's still absolutely fine if you wanna do a bit of Skype and Zoom and whatever. Now this year, Xiaomi launched another barrel of Redmi phones covering a range of budgets. The Redmi Note 13 5G, the 13 Pro 5G, and the 13 Pro Plus 5G. All of these boast a punchy AMOLED screen, a big old battery, and respectable specs for their price points, just like the Poco phones and not to mention software that's very similar to those Pocos. The regular Note 13 is decent, but these Pro models are a proper upgrade with slick gaming performance, faster battery charging, and a few other benefits. And just to make your choice even more complicated, all of these Redmi Blows have a completely different set of camera optics slapped on the back. Got a 200 megapixel primary shooter on both the Pro and the Pro Plus, whereas the regular Redmi Note 13 sports a 108 megapixel shooter. Of course, picture quality isn't always directly proportional to megapixel count, although the regular Redmi Note 13 also doesn't sport optical image stabilization, unlike the Pros. You do get practically the same set of camera modes and features on all three of these devices though, including a dedicated pro mode, a night mode, a portrait mode, and a high res mode, which of course is 200 megs in the case of the pros, 108 megs on the regular Redmi Note 13 5G. And frankly, even with that AI mode switched off on all three, you'll still get very different photo results at different times of day, depending on which phone you're using. For instance, the tones on this photo of a lovely leaf couldn't be more different across the full range. In fact, I actually found the more accurate colours were generally produced by the Redmi Note 13 Pro. I gotta say, low light shots are a struggle with all three, especially if we're talking living subjects. Although those pros do produce slightly brighter, sharper pics most of the time when you're shooting indoors or in the evenings. And they also handle HDR situations slightly more confidently. You've got a basic 8 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter and all three Xiaomi handsets too. Again, certainly nothing to shout about, but it's there if you need a more pulled back view or a more dramatic angle. And of course, there's no telephoto shooter on any of these Redmi Note 13 blowers. The final lens in that triple lens setup is just a simple 2 megapixel macro snapper. In other words, a waste of friggin' glass. Now as for video, while well, you can shoot up to 4K resolution footage at just 30 frames per second on the Pro models, but again, that Redmi Note 13 lagging behind, it can only capture footage at 720p or 1080p Full HD. And all three of these Xiaomi phones sport a 16 megapixel selfie shooter, which is absolutely fine. Does a pretty decent job of capturing your mug, even when it's fairly low light conditions, although obviously things start to get a bit noisy and yeah. But anyway, I've fully reviewed the Redmi Note 13 Pro and Pro Plus. My Redmi Note 13 5G review is incoming. And you can check out my comparison of all three if you want to hear a bold northerner bang on about tech for yet another 15-20 minutes. Another favourite of mine is the OnePlus Nord 2T, which once again sports a slick AMOLED screen, smooth everyday performance and dependable battery life. Slapped on that arse is yet another 50 megapixel Sony IMX766 camera sensor, and it's once again a good un in more circumstances. Most of my test photos look pretty natural, with vibrant colours when appropriate, and enough sharp details so they look good on a proper big telly screen. The focus is fast to react and rarely messes up, even when the subject is in motion. At night, you still get attractive looking pics with that IMX766 sensor, even without employing OnePlus's dedicated nightscape mode. That's possibly helped along by the Dimensity Processor's upgraded abilities. 
things have to be really dim before you finally get some grin and ugly stuff creeping into your shots. Indoor snaps do tend to come out quite warm, but again with impressive detail considering they were spaffed out by a mid-range mobile. Oh, and by the way, you are very welcome for this here horrific nightmare fuel, which comes courtesy of that mental Google event. All I can say is thank God I was hammered by the time I shot these photos. Now, if anything in this camera setup needed upgrading is definitely that 8 megapixel ultra wide angle snapper. This is okay-ish for outdoor snaps with good lighting, although colours do look a bit wonky, and the results are pretty bloody dreadful once you move indoors or you try actually snapping stuff at night. You can also shoot up to 4K resolution video on the OnePlus Nord 2T, and this again does the job for your home movies, offering sharp detail, accurate colours more often than not, and strong enough stabilisation so your footage isn't reduced to a janky, shaky mess whenever you twitch your arm a bit. In lower light, things don't immediately look terrible, and the audio capture was good enough to clearly pick up and emphasise vocals both in front of and behind the camera. And finally, up front, you've got a 32 meg IMX615 sensor for shooting all of those lovely selfies. And this works fine in good light, but in more ambient conditions, you will need a steady hand to avoid blur. A steady hand I clearly didn't have after quaffing too many random vodka and tequila cocktails. And OnePlus also offers a slightly fresher Nord 3, which I'm yet to review due to sketchy UK availability, but the last time I checked it was there on the website. Got slightly upgraded specs, so definitely worth a squint. And if that's still a bit too much cash for you, well, OnePlus also offers up the slightly cheaper, but still effing marvellous Nord CE3 Lite, where the CE bit stands for Core Edition. And this still rocks some very impressive specs for just 300 quid. Highlights include a crisp 120Hz display, a Snapdragon chipset that can still just about cope with games like Genshin Impact, and excellent battery life that'll last you all day, no worries. But one of the best bits is that 108 meg rear camera, which punches above its weight at this price point. And again, if you've used a OnePlus smartphone before, you'll be right at home with the camera app. It's very easy to get on with, all of the usual toggles and various camera modes. And of course, your obligatory bit of AI scene enhancement as well. And as I mentioned, I recently buggered off to South Korea and took the opportunity to snap a lot of touristy pics with the Nord CE3 Lite. Here's a whole bunch of sample shots that I snapped using the Nord on my excursion. Those daytime shots, really impressed with their natural look and tones. And yes, even this garish gold Gangnam style statue was accurately captured. The Nord seemed to cope pretty well with strong contrast as well. These HDR style situations didn't put it off. And yeah, there's no telephoto lens here, but the Nord CE3 Lite offers three times lossless zoom thanks to the massive sensor. You could always just shoot a 108 meg ultra high res pic and then crop in yourself. The more ambient conditions, the Nord CE3 Lite, again, seems to hold up pretty well. It uses 9 in 1 pixel binning to brighten things up, while the digital stabilisation can counter hand tremors from a few too many cast beers or sawdews. And of course, you've got the usual portrait shenanigans if you're shooting a human subject, you can completely change up the bokeh effect. And you've got a handful of other camera modes packed away in the more section as well, including a good bit of pro action. So you can tweak the various settings before you shoot. And if you like to shoot home movies with your smartphone, well, this does top off at full HD resolution. There's no 4K option. And here again is just a small sample of the footage that I shot out in South Korea. As you can see, nice poppy colours when you're recording a vivid subject. The stabilisation's pretty decent, despite the lack of OIS. And even in the evenings, you'll get a respectable amount of detail packed in there. And then last up, that selfie cam is a 16 megapixel shooter. Once again, with a portrait mode where you can tweak the background blur effect. And this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is why I'm not on Instagram. Now, if you want a bit of stock Android action with your fresh new camera smartphone and you want to bothered by slightly sketchy software updates, well, Mod Roller is also well worth a squint. The Moto G84 costs just £250 here in Blighty, and yet you still get a snazzy leather style back just like that Redmi Note 13 Pro Plus as well as another eye-pleasing OLED screen maxing out at 120Hz. Sadly, you've got the slightly creaky Snapdragon 695 chipset in charge, so you're not likely to be dribbling into your neck flesh thinking about all of that raw power. But it's good enough for gaming on Call of Duty, PUBG, etc. And even Genshin Impact can run at an alright nip at the lowest graphics settings. Likewise, the Moto G84's battery charges slowly, but it's another 5000 mAh beast, so no worries as far as longevity goes. And as for that 50 meg main camera with optical image stabilisation, well, it's a decent wee snapper for this sub £300 price point. 
Now it is your standard Motorola camera app slapped on here, complete with all the helpful guidance. So for instance, if it detects a human face or close to a human face, like good old Veronica here, then you will be advised to switch to portrait for instance. And this will allow you to get a shot with some gorgeous bokeh style action in the background, fully adjustable, of course. Now you've got plenty of other bonus modes on here as well, including a pro mode if you want to manually tweak the likes of the white balance, the ISO levels. You can also use this to shoot raw format images. And then there's plenty of other bonus bits stacked on here, including a dedicated night vision mode, which can switch on automatically when the G84 detects that the lighting is crap. You've got an ultra res mode, the usual spot color shenanigans, etc. And here's a handful of sample photos shot with that 50 meg primary camera with its optical image stabilization. That really helps out in lower light environments, just helps to prevent shake and blur. Colors are reasonably accurately reproduced. There's some pretty fine detail packed in there. And at night time you do have that dedicated night mode which can help to brighten up and sharpen up a shot as well. If you want to shoot yourself some video, well unfortunately this does top off at full HD resolution. There is no 4K option on here. The best you can manage is swapping between 30 and 60 frames per second. And again the Moto G84 does a pretty respectable job of just capturing some simple shareable shots and home movies. Kind of lacking in finer detail but the audio pickup absolutely fine, the stabilisation is good. And then last up around the front of the Moto G84, you've got a 16 megapixel selfie cam, which can capture absolute bangers like this. Here's a few slightly less cack examples. And I did find that colors were less vivid, less punchy using that selfie cam. But generally the portrait mode does a decent job. You do have a screen flash feature if you absolutely need it. And yeah, if you need to, you can also shoot some full HD resolution footage using that selfie camera. It's best off just reserved for your video chats and what have you. It does a perfectly fine job here, you know, reasonably good visuals and the audio pickup, thankfully, nice and clear. And then if you've got a wee bit more cash to spare, there's always the Moto Edge 40 Neo with its spangly Lardida Pantone design around back and gorgeous 6.55 inch 144Hz POLED display up front. Performance is upgraded to MediaTek's Dimensity 7030, and this can even cope with a bit of Genshin impact, albeit on lower detail settings. And that sizable 5000 mAh capacity battery supports nippy 68 watt wires charging. As for the optics, well, our 50 meg primary camera is fine for everyday photo shenanigans, if not quite as capable as that excellent Pixel 7a. Now, if you know your way around a Motorola smartphone, you'll probably be quite familiar with the camera app by now. It's fairly user-friendly, despite the fact it can be quite intimidating at first. Lots of toggles to play around with, lots of different camera modes. But Motorola has tried to make things as easy as possible on you. So, for instance, if it detects you're trying to shoot a human subject, it will make handy suggestions like switch to portrait mode. And the Edge 40 Neo can also automatically switch on the night mode when it detects the lighting is a bit crap. And then swapping between the primary and the ultra wide angle shooter is just a case of tapping down here. You've also got fast access to a macro mode and you can digitally zoom in up to two times like so. And then you can continue to zoom in by pinching. And here's just a small smattering of sample shots that I snapped around the old homestead in my first 24 hours with the Edge 40 Neo. Overall for a budget friendly blow it seems pretty capable. In indoor situations things get a bit softer, a bit warmer. But that night mode certainly helps out when the lighting is proper cack. The lights of the portrait mode, as dependable as ever, really helps your subject to stand out. Of course, if the camera is the number one priority for you, you're a stickler for that photo quality, I'd say maybe try and bump up your budget a bit and grab the Pixel 7a instead. But otherwise, the Motorola Edge 40 Neo will certainly do the job for capturing all those lovely family memories. And Motorola has chucked on a dedicated Pro mode with fast access to settings like the white balance and the ISO levels. And you can also use this to shoot raw format images or raw and JPEG. JPEG, JPEG. And if you want to shoot some home movies, well, you can do so at up to 4K resolution. Although if you want to bump up the frame rate to 60 frames per second, well, that does max out at full HD resolution. And here's a wee bit of ultra HD resolution video action captured by the Motorola Edge 40 Neo. Stabilization's not too bad when you're moving about. The audio pickup seems fine. So yeah, I should do the job again for those simple shareable clips. And then finally, if we flip around to that floating selfie cam, well, it's a 32 megapixel selfie shooter. Captures 8 megapixel images using 4 in 1 pixel binning. And that selfie shooter is fine. I didn't look like complete arse juice in any of my shots. Colors were quite muted, however, but you know, indoors it copes all right. And in very low light, you've got a blind and screen flash feature. 
And you can once again shoot up to 4K resolution a video using that front facing selfie cam and the audio pickup seems absolutely fine so should do the job for a basic bit of blogging otherwise your video chat action. And if you can find them online I would also recommend the Vivo V30 and V30 Pro. These eye-catching blowers come in a selection of designs so you don't need to go with this here elderly couple's bathroom motif. Both the regular and the Pro boast a 6.78 inch AMOLED display, you got a 5000mAh battery with lippy 80 watt charging and that slightly janky fun touch software. However, if you hoi more cash at Vivo for the V30 Pro, you'll not only get an upgraded MediaTek chipset, but you'll also get yourself some proper Zeiss branded camera tech. Now you've got a 50 megapixel primary shooter on both Vivo blowers with optical image stabilization, but it is upgraded on the Pro model to Sony's fresh new IMX920. But because you've got that Zeiss brand in here on the Pro model, you do have the Zeiss natural mode, whereas it's just a bog standard natural mode here on the regular V30. Now occasionally the Pro model captures more fine detail in softer light, producing sharper looking photos other times it's a considerably closer result. And I actually found that the Vivo V30 Pro struggled a wee bit more than the regular model to focus on some subjects, either up close or when you're dealing with tricky contrast. And this is possibly just due to early software. Likewise, the Vivo V30 Pro's Zeiss Natural Mode appears to highlight certain colours so they stand out a bit more. But overall, I really loved the photos I shot with the Vivo V30 Pro. While I do miss a proper dedicated telephoto lens for getting closer to a subject without cropping and losing detail, these optics are certainly more than good enough for the average family snapper who just wants to shoot some great looking pics of their sprogs, or also travellers who want to snap impressive looking foreign stuff and then show it all off on their social medias. But of course you've got the same set of bonus modes on both of these cameras. Portrait mode to get a nice bokeh style background effect. Just really help your subject to stand out. And of course you've got a dedicated night mode as well and if you swap to the more section plenty of extra bonus bits to choose between. Considering that max 50 meg resolution with both of these blows you've also got a dedicated pro mode. And again you've got that Zeiss natural rather than just the standard natural selection and you can shoot raw format images with both the V30 Pro and the V30 5G. When it comes to the alternate shooters where you've got a 50 megapixel ultra wide angle snapper with both of these handsets. However, here on the Pro you've also got a dedicated portrait shooter. It's another 50 megapixel effort IMX 816 sensor. So when you swap into the old portrait mode it actually swaps to that third lens whereas here on the regular V35G it's just using the original 50 megapixel primary shooter. You got the same beauty mode shenanigans on both if you want to smooth out your skin, change your skin tone, whatever. But as you can see there is a change when you go to the bokeh style effect. It's a simple slide and scale here on the Vivo V35 G. Whereas the Pro model actually has a bunch of Zeiss branded filters you can choose between. And both the Vivo V35 G and the V30 Pro sport that aura light flash around back. This can be tweaked to make it either cool or warm to suit the environment and really bring out your skin tone or at least make it look like you've got a skin tone in my case. And more differences when it comes to the video tech as well because you can shoot 4K resolution footage on both of these blowers but only the Pro offers that at 60 frames per second. You're stuck at 30 FPS here on the regular V35 G. There is one other noticeable difference. If you're shooting at full HD level here on the V35G, you can use that ultra wide angle shooter. But if you swap up to 4K, that option disappears. Whereas you can shoot 4K with the ultra wide angle shooter here on the Pro. But you do get quite similar results out of the V35G and the V30 Pro. Nice and crisp visuals thanks to the 4K resolution and of course you don't get the hyper real 60fps action on the V30 but honestly if you're just shooting some simple home movies or whatnot, it'll do the job. And then finally the Vivo V30 Pro and the V35 G both spot a 50 megapixel selfie shooter. There's not actually much difference at all in the picture quality between the V30 Pro and the regular V35 G but again if you're shooting video using that selfie cam well you got 4k at 30 or 60 fps on the pro model whereas once again you're limited to just 30 fps here on the regular and finally for around 300 quid you can always grab the nokia g60 which comes packing years of software support some eco-friendly design and a 50 megapixel primary camera sensor although sadly without any ois built in 
Nokia was unfortunately a little bit vague when it comes to exactly which camera sensor has been used in the Nokia G60, but I do know there's no optical image stabilization packed in there. But you know what, I got some really good looking photos out of this thing, packed with enough sharp details so they looked good even on a proper big screen, particularly these portrait shots. Colours come out close to natural, even when you're snapping quite vibrant subjects. And while strong contrast usually results in oversaturation, the Nokia G60 does hold up well compared with some of its rivals. Indoor snaps are often a bit grainy, but again, nothing too horrific. Although at night, the Nokia G60 does struggle quite a bit. And while the night mode brightens things up considerably, it often can't help with the soft focus and noise. For a different kind of view, you can always swap to the basic 5 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter. And this is pretty basic stuff. It struggles in more testing conditions, but it's there if you need it. And that final lens slapped on the back of the Nokia G60 is just a depth sensor for those portrait shots. Now, if you swap on over to the video mode, you will quickly discover that there's no way of shooting 4K resolution footage here. It does max out at 1080p Full HD at either 30 or 60 FPS. And strong light will definitely need to be avoided at all times, otherwise the resulting footage will look, well, just like this right here, really. Same goes for night video as well. Like most of the competition, this phone just kind of falls on its arse a bit. But in good lighting, you will get respectable looking video clips with decent audio pickup and the stabilization ain't too bad either. And then last up is the 8 megapixel, I believe it is, selfie camera. This does a pretty good job in stronger light, making sure that your face is fully in focus with attractive portrait results if you want. But again, indoor shots will look rather soft and at night everything gets a bit grainy. And there you have it, my lovelies. That is my pick right now of the very best budget-friendly camera phones you can grab yourself right here in the UK. Now, I've only included blows that I've personally tested out and reviewed right here on TechSpert, so I may have missed out your personal favourite. If so, feel free to call me a massive dum-dum down in the comments below and let us know what your pick would have been. And in the meantime, please do plug subscribe and ding that notifications bell for more on the latest and greatest tech and have yourselves a really wonderful rest of the week. Cheers, everyone. Love you.